everyone. <clears throat> my name is Alejandro Pereira. I'm the chair of the Sonotec TV subsection, and my colleague, Dr. Simon Cadmus, who is the program secretary. Uh, both we are veterinarians, and we are very uh, pleased to have a, a good number of people coming to our session. This is a symposium in which uh, the theme is Every TV Case Counts. And this is along with the uh, goal to have a, a world free of a TV in 2035. And uh, sonotic TV cases are for sure very important and sometimes not well uh, estimated. And in this, we have um, issues like diagnostics, surveillance, um, vaccines, and all the tools that we need to improve in order to reach the goal of uh, zero TV. So we have in our symposia five speakers. I want uh, to tell you that um, one uh, of them is not coming, Dr. Patrick Noonan, and also uh, Dr. Kathy Moser that is in the uh, schedule is not participating, but we have Dr. Fred Quinn who will be covering that uh, space with a very interesting um, topic. So with that, um, I want also to um, tell you that there is a list of attendees going around. We need your information and we need also your uh, interest to participate and be members of our subsection. We need to increase our team to engage with this important goal. Um, so we will start. We have uh, four participants. First is Dr. Jerry Kangelosi. Uh, I'm planning to have uh, each speaker to spend 15 minutes in their presentations, and we will have uh, some couple, three minutes for questions and answers or comments, considering that we will not have uh, one speaker. So uh, please uh, join me to, help, uh, to welcome Dr. Jerry Kangelosi for the first topic, which is non-invasive invasive diagnostic sampling for tuberculosis in humans and animals. Please, Dr. All right, well, thank you very much, Alejandro, and uh, I, I want to thank every, uh, the organizers for inviting me. Um, got my conflict of interest statement, I have none. Um, I'm going to start out with a term that you're, you've all seen, One Health. Um, it all means uh, something different to all of us. Um, uh, I, I look at it uh, from a researcher standpoint, and as a researcher, uh, what One Health means to me is a, it's sort of a framework in which uh, people who work in veterinary medicine and human medicine can learn from each other as uh, we develop new approaches. And so the uh, question that we uh, wanted to address in human TB is, um, can we get away from sputum? So as you all know, in human TB, uh, the sputum sample is a standard sample for, um, for detecting uh, mycobacterium tuberculosis in human, in, in, for pulmonary tuberculosis. And it has many, many limitations. Nobody's a fan of it, okay? Um, it's uh, difficult to obtain from some, from some patients, especially children, but also from many adults. It's very difficult to get uh, good quality specimens. Um, I work in an occupational health uh, department, and it's uh, a well-known occupational hazard. Sputum collection uh, requires um, special facilities like this uh, isolated booth here in Bangladesh. Um, it's a complex, viscous material that's challenging to process, so it's one of the major hurdles in uh, developing point-of-care diagnostics for TB. Um, difficult to standardize, it limits, limits sensitivity, and increases costs. And um, a, lot, a theme that we're seeing a lot in this conference is the need for active case finding. And sputum is very much a limiting factor in, um, in active case finding. So there's been a need, there's been a, a, a big effort to uh, identify um, alternatives to sputum as a diagnostic sample for pulmonary TB. And uh, because my time is limited, I'm not going to slog you through all of them, but just let you know that uh, basically the success has been limited so far. So our um, solution, which uh, really came from veterinary medicine, uh, was to use oral swabs. So in oral swabs, uh, basically the inner cheek or the tongue, and I'll show you some data in just a second that the tongue works much better than the inner cheek, um, is rubbed with basically a swab. 
Uh, we started out using these Omni swabs, and um, the tip is ejected into a transport buffer, and then that buffer is uh, um, tested for M tuberculosis DNA by qPCR. Um, so it's a very simple, very simple process. Um, the big strength of this is speed and simplicity. Um, a couple of us could sample everybody in this room in less than five minutes, and you, none of you would have to get out of your chairs. And so that's, that's really what, what it's all about. This idea came from uh, my colleague at University of Washington, Lisa Jones Engel, who has been using this method for years uh, for collecting samples for te uh, testing non-human primates for TB. Uh, monkeys both uh, captive and in the wild. Uh, monkeys um, can't produce sputum. Um, if they could, they wouldn't do it on demand. Um, and so uh, she uses these oral swabs. And she has consistently gotten positives, and consistently no one has really believed her, um, because with PCR, there's, there's things that can go wrong. And with these wild monkeys, it's very difficult. There's no gold standards that she can pin it to, and that's a challenge that everybody in zoonotic TB has to deal with. Um, and so what we did, we thought, even though um, the proof wasn't there, we thought the idea was quite plausible. And um, the reason is, is because I was trained as a bacteriologist, and, and bacteria stick to things. So for years and years, uh, there's been many attempts to identify M. tuberculosis DNA in cells in saliva. Well, saliva is a liquid matrix. It's very different from the surface of, of the mouth. Even though they're both in the oral cavity, the surface of the mouth, the tongue, the cheeks, the epithelial cells, the oral mucosa, that's where the bacteria are more likely to be because you, you don't find bacteria swimming around in matrices. You find them associated with surfaces. And what Lisa was doing is she was sampling surfaces. And, um, so, and there's been lots of reports of mycobacteria st uh, sticking to surfaces as well. So we hypothesized that bacilli accumulate on the oral mucosa based on these previous reports and on just the fact that we're dealing with bacteria. So oral swabs are not saliva. We, uh, about five years ago, we initiated a, a small pilot project with departmental funding, and uh, we just looked at uh, 20 sputum gene expert confirmed cases in Worcester, South Africa. This is working with SATVI. Um, and, and University of Cape Town, and then uh, healthy controls in Seattle. So it's a small, very limited study. Um, obviously, the controls and the cases weren't well matched. But what we saw is that, oops, um, out of the 20 cases, 18 we were able to detect by oral swabs, and out of the 20 controls, we did not get any. We did not get any false positives. But um, this was an unblinded study, and it's very small. Um, so we set out to do a much uh, larger study and a better, a better structured study. And this is with again with SAFI, uh, South African Tuberculosis Vaccine Initiative, and with funding from the NIH and the Bill and Melinda Gates Foundation. Um, we have started collecting uh, uh, swab samples from uh, adult pulmonary cases, and to date we've, d we've tested samples from a subset of them, 64 confirmed t uh, TB cases, of which 49 were uh, sputum expert positive, 37 uh, ill, no TB, healthy, con or they're not healthy, but they did, they're confirmed not to have TB, and 34 healthy controls, all in South Africa. Um, and uh, we collected uh, samples from additional sites, uh, the buckle swabs, the t uh, cheek swabs, in other words, tongue and gum. Um, and we used two different swabs. So we used both these uh, uh, Omni swabs, and we also used these things called Pure Flocks, which are simply cheaper. So we thought we'd give it a try. And it was a, a blinded study. So the results to date, one of the most important, before I show you the sensitivity and specificity, one of the most important findings is that we found that the tongue swabs work much, much better than the cheek swabs. And so uh, since we collected both cheek and tongue swabs from each, uh, each subject, um, if you look at CQ values, which is a QPCR value, the lower the, C, the lower the CQ value, the stronger the signal. Um, basically, uh, six CQ value difference on the average um, between, uh, between uh, cheek omni swabs and tongue omni swabs. And so that corresponds to about 64 fold difference in the uh, signal strength. Um, we also found that the uh, we, we did uh, pure flocks both on the uh, te cheek and on the tongue, and we found that the pure flocks worked somewhat better. One point, uh, one point, whatever that works out to be, 1.3 uh, um, CQ value difference. So it's a more limited difference, but it was significant. Um, so the obvious thing to try next is to use the better swab and in the better site, and we haven't done that yet. 
And uh, there's a lot of other swab products out there that might actually do even better. Okay, so our findings were uh, among sputum expert positive subjects. So these were people that were both clinically and laboratory diagnosed with sputum. Um, we, using two swabs per subject, we detected 45 of the 49 sputum expert um, subjects. Um, and we're currently enrolling and sampling 100 more sputum expert positive subjects. Um, specificity is decent, but in a non-invasive sample like this, we didn't expect 100%. Um, so we do see some, a little bit of background. Um, the diagnostic yields is the interesting part. So as I said, we had a total of 64 cases that were, so in addition to the 49 sputum expert positive cases, we had 15 cases who were clinically diagnosed to have TB. They were sputum expert negative, but either they were diagnosed based on clinical, st uh, clinical criteria or they were culture positive. And we detected a portion of those as well. We detected, using tongue swabs, we detected five of those. So the diagnostic yields of, um, the diagnostic yields of uh, sputum and uh, what we call OSA, oral swabs, are actually about equivalent, but we're cheating here a little bit. We're look, we did two swabs versus one sputum, and if you did two sputums, probably you'd do better with that. So I think the conservative, um, the conservative interpretation is we are approaching the sensitivity of sputum testing. Um, we're not there yet, but we're, we're getting very, very close. And uh, actually, if you did both uh, sputum and swab, for example, on the same day, you would uh, actually improve yield over either one alone. And that's an interesting thing about the swabs, in, is that um, basically when you produce a sputum in the morning, if you produce a positive sputum in the morning, and then you don't produce another positive sputum for the rest of the day, you might still be positive by oral swabs for the rest of the day. And so collecting a swab sample and a sputum sample in a single visit might be the equivalent of collecting two different sputum samples over the course of two different time periods. And um, so that's, that's actually a, a, a way that uh, this can actually help right away. Okay, so why is there more MTB DNA on tongue swabs than cheek swabs? Well, um, we also tested for human DNA in these things, and actually the human DNA is not different. So we get a lot more um, uh, MTB DNA in the tongue swabs and the cheek swabs, but the human DNA is different. So we used to think that uh, basically the, um, the bacilli were associating with the oral epithelium. Now we're wondering maybe if it's associating with bacterial biofilm instead. So this white slime you see here on Miley's tongue is bacterial biofilm. <laughs> and uh, we know that when we're um, collecting these swabs uh, that we're picking up a lot of this kind of white stuff. We also know that we're leaving a lot of that stuff behind. And so um, one way that we can easily, uh, not easily, but we, we hope to be able to get to uh, uh, equivalent, full equivalence of sputum is to just collect more of that material. Okay, pediatric, um, I probably should hurry it up. Um, basically, pediatric, Pediatric TB is very difficult to diagnose. It's very difficult to get uh, sputum from children, okay? And when you do get sputum from them, usually it has to be induced and it has to, um, and often it's negative, okay? So we're working with a different group in South Africa. Uh, Heather Zarr and Mark Nickel, um, they have an ongoing pediatric cohort. And uh, we had a group of 200 suspected t uh, pediatric TB cases, and they managed to get two induced sputums from each of these 200 children, um, aged two months on up to about nine years old. It's really a feat, but they did. So they got two induced sputum that they cultured. Okay, so we've looked at 124 of them so far. We also got two oral swabs. So two induced sputum cultures and two oral swabs. And we've looked at 124 children, and it, really they can be divided into three groups. Confirmed TB, meaning they have disease and they are culture positive and one or the other sputum. Um, unconfirmed TB is, uh, they were culture negative, but they were clinically diagnosed and treated. So most of these children are hospitalized and they're very, very sick. And then unlikely TB, they're culture negative and determined not to have TB. And we only had a few of those. Uh, 17 of those. So um, children with at least one positive swab by group, we only detected with the swabs, we only detected seven of the 37 culture positive children. However, we also detected 18 out of 70 of the culture negative TB positive children. So we are able to detect uh, a significant number of children who were not detectable by two induced sputum cultures. 
And the numbers we believe are real because even though our unlikely TB set the no is it's very small, we got no false positives. So statistically, that's diff that's that's significant. So the bottom line is that OSA can significantly improve pediatric cases, case finding over sputum culture alone. So um, those are my conclusions. I want to get uh, t to finish up with uh, getting back to zoonotic TB, which is the subject of this. We have, um, we're very interested uh, in, in trying out swabs with zoonotic TB, now the, the, with, with bovine TB. Now the mouths of cows are very different from the mouths of humans. And so generally what's, what's done is nasal swabbing. And this has actually been done for many, many years. Uh, my graduate student, uh, Megan Devian, uh, put together this, uh, this list of publications. But they're publications going back to the 60s or 70s where this, this has been attempted. Well, maybe up to the 90s, I guess, going back to the dawn of the PCR age. Um, as always, uh, you know, basically you get uh, certain percentages that are positive, but it's not known really what the actual gold standard is. We, working with Tom McGram at UC Davis and Peter Rabinowitz at, in my department at University of Washington, we were able to obtain nose swabs from 19 skin test positive animals in uh, uh, the West Nile area of Uganda. And um, there, were some, there were some transport storage issues. So these things sat in a storage area at room temp for, um, for uh, um, uh, something like six months. And so we thought they would be trash, but we did get five weekly positive samples. And these are all um, skin test positive animals, and that's all we know about it so far. So this is just uh, a hint that um, what we have, what, what started with a veterinary medicine idea looks like it's going to be a very useful human medicine idea, but we should not forget <laughs> where it came from and what the utility is going back to veterinary medicine. So some people involved with this, uh, uh, Rachel Wood is the leader of this project in my lab and she's led a, a variety of other people who have worked in this area in my lab. Lisa jones Engel started it all. Angelique Luabea and Mark Hathrell at uh, South Africa TB Vaccine Initiative were uh, <laughs> Uh, very, very important collaborators, as well as their colleagues at SATFI, and Heather Zahr and Mark Nickel, who ran the uh, pediatric cohort. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Dr. Cangelosi. I think it's a very interesting topic, and of course, um, it is what we need to increase our opportunities to a better diagnosis of uh, tuberculosis, bovine tuberculosis, or human tuberculosis. And for sure, uh, it's hard to get sputum from the animals, so swabs <laughs> is a very good option that has been used and needs to be improved. Uh, any comments or questions? We have three minutes for uh, some questions. Uh, John Kanene from Michigan State University. Thank you so much for this wonderful presentation. One question, I might have missed it. In terms of cattle, did you actually try the tongue? In term, what was the question? I didn't uh, know. In terms of bovine, did you no, use we the did tongue? The nose, nasal but, swabs. but not the tongue. Not the tongue with cows. Do you think it's a good idea? I think it's a good idea. Okay. We have some um, data that I could share with you later. Well, we'll try that. I would love to hear that. Wow. Yes, right. Yeah, well, we just need, uh, you know, it's always hard with gold standards. And I guess my understanding with cow, the only way to sure, be sure they have TB is to do an autopsy, right? right. And so um, I guess it's possible, but yeah. <laughs> Hi, Jerry. Great talk. Um, in, uh, I hate to ask a human question, um, but in, in your human cohorts, um, what proportion of those individuals were HIV positive? Uh, I can't remember the exact proportion. It's a little, it's under half, um, uh -huh. but we did not see any different, you know, so be because we get a quantitative readout with the qPCR, we mm -hmm. can do uh, regression. Mm -hmm. We're seeing no, di we see no difference between t uh, HIV positive and negative. Because that, that's, that's quite exciting when you think but about it. I think it's a yeah, good thing, yeah, yes. Yeah, yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much, Dr.
Um, very, very interesting topic. We are now moving to uh, Dr. Fred Queen. Now talking about a new uh, approach of a transmission model uh, in ferrets. Thank you, Fred. So th thank you for allowing me to do this. Um, and I uh, hope I didn't uh, cause any. Uh, so, uh, but good morning. Uh, so yeah, I would like to discuss with you uh, a system we've been working on for the last year, year and a half. Uh, we thought at the time it, would, uh, it was a, going to be a simple task. Uh, <laughs> it, it certainly has not turned out that way, and I sure want to share this with you. Um, so the, the concept here is looking at, at, at human transmission or animal transmission or zoonotic transmission. The problem is we don't have an, a, an animal model that is convenient. So we know humans, cattle, monkeys, uh, they do transmit tuberculosis to each other. Uh, the problem with the small animal models that we use, they do not, and, uh, or they don't do it effectively, or they don't do it correctly. So we were looking for a model system that would allow us to look at efficient human or, or cow-like transmission of tuberculosis. And the, the impetus for this was the failure of the MV85A vaccine in the human clinical trials. So as you probably know, um, the, the, the gist of this was is all of these vaccines and the ones that are currently in human clinical trials now are looking for sterilizing immunity and, and it's just not going to happen. Uh, we just aren't, aren't, aren't there. So instead, the angle we wanted to take was to look for a vaccine potentially that would, that would inhibit or in a partial way or, a, or entirely transmission. Because again, transmission is the mechanism by which TB goes between human cases. So even if an individual still may have the disease, if he can't transmit, it, it, we, we've accomplished a, a great task. So what we were, again, measuring, we, we needed a model that could uh, monitor or, or assess measurable disease states and then uh, looking at vaccines that would decrease the threshold. That was the original idea. Whoops, oh no, what did I do here? Okay, so just a little bit about transmission. Um, you probably all remember your r naught, but uh, it's dependent upon pathogen infectivity, exposure time, dose proximity, and host susceptibility. Those are the standards you get out of the textbook. What we're missing is a very big part of it. This was the big surprise in our studies, but not really in the general scheme of investigators who have been looking at respiratory pathogens, uh, pneumococcus, haemophilus, for, for, for decades. And that is the, that is the uh, colonization state. So in the tuberculosis world, this is never discussed. The bacteria magically enter uh, the respiratory tract and magically end up in your alveoli. What happens in between is not known and it's not discussed. So what I'd like to do is share with you some of our data, some data other people have generated, as a discussion point for us as a community, because I think this is going to turn out to be a very important part of the tuberculosis disease process. So just sort of colonization 101, and most of this again is with strep streptococci, haemophilus, um, Neisseria, et cetera, from the bacterial world. And so I always like to quote my former uh, mentor Stanley Falco and he says the purpose of a bacterium is to become bacteria. I mean they have a very simple, they have a very simple goal in life um, and therefore causing disease or killing the host is not in obviously our best interest and it's not in the bacteria's best interest either. And so the, the human or the animal is just another, it's just another surface uh, from which to uh, get nutrients and, re and replicate and therefore uh, they're looking for this commensalistic relationship. So, so, so the disease is not a part, if you believe in this philosophy, it's not an, a, a critical part of the process. So after being transmitted, if this is a respiratory pathogen, and you can make the same discussion point for a foodborne pathogen, uh, so but after being transmitted to the nasopharynx, a, a successful respiratory colonizer such as the streptococci, they have to escape the mucus. Um, they have to attach to the epithelial lining. They have to establish a nutrition source. They have to induce some kind of modest inflammation because that is the mechanism for uh, producing some kind of a nutritional source. They have to avoid innate immune response clearance. They have to avoid induction uh, of invasive disease because that in, in, then activates the, the, uh, uh, the, the more uh, robust acquired immune response. And they have to transmit. So simple tasks. So 
if you think about this from the mycobacterial perspective then, what happens between the inhalation uh, or the ingestion uh, of mycobacteria and the, and the eventual arrival in the alveolar macrophages? Okay, again, this is an area that I, was, I presented this at a meeting recently and they said, oh, we don't care about that. Well, I think we should. I think this is, the, we're, we're missing a lot of this disease and I think this is an area that, that may generate some interesting points. Could there be a colonization step? Could this be a missing source for transmission? And, and the question for our group here is, could this be a, a source for zoonotic transmission? Because we were just discussing yesterday, we have cattle that are culture positive uh, in, the, in the milk, but the, the cattle have no lesions. How can that be? Maybe they're colonized. So again, this is, this is a question we, we need to discuss. So here's our model. Uh, we love these little guys. Uh, we have 500 of them on our campus, uh, mostly from the influenza program. Uh, but if you think about the question of natural infection, what does that mean? These are small, large animals that cough and sneeze, and they're social, just like humans, right? Maybe not small animals, but um, they transmit infectious particles, they generate human-like or cow-like disease, and at least a portion of the exposed contacts, and you have to have these critical immunological reagents to be able to study. So this is a problem with a rabbit and, and some of these other models. They're, they're just, they, they do some of these factors, but they don't have... Um, available reagents. So I've just given you a short list of some of the models that are currently under study for MTB and Embovis. Uh, camels, believe it or not, are, are, are being looked at. The cow model, the non-human primate model for the large animals, and in the small model, the guinea pig has been looked at, but it is a unidirectional model since it doesn't cough or sneeze. And Ed Nardell did some really cool work uh, in South Africa looking at that. And the rabbit is a reasonable model, but Again, there's a modest reagent re availability and they're not particularly social for anybody who's worked with rabbits. Uh, that leaves the ferret. And so I want to give you some of the positives here. So we can get large numbers and they're outbred. Uh, the pulmonary distribution of the lesions, and we've shown this for M. tuberculosis. I'm going to give you a little bit of data and it's been shown by uh, other groups uh, such as um, David McMurray at Texas A&M for Mycobacterium bovis. You can manipulate this nutritional status. So if some of our questions about why is this particular group of, of people or animals get infected and this group does, maybe it has something to do with their nutritional status or parasitic co-infections or, you know, again, the sky's the limit. You can do all of these things with the ferret. Um, the vac uh, uh, vaccine safety screens, we're, we, we've got this ongoing for MTB. We would like to do it for M. Bovis. Um, Long-term vaccine immunity studies, uh, there's lots of reagents available uh, for the ferret because this has been the model for influenza transmission for many years. And so they've done a really good job of developing reagents. Correlates of protection, reasonable cost, uh, and again, previously shown susceptibility for bovis, M. avium, microti, and salatum. Um, there's an established transmission model for influenza. They cough and they sneeze. Uh, you can find these mycobacteria in the feces, stomach lavage. Um, therefore, you could look at it from, a, from an oral infection model as well as a respiratory infection model. They're very social. They're cheaper than primates. <laughs> uh, and you, housing within ABSL3, they're outbred. And we could go on and on. They're, they're, the, the other really interesting part of this for looking at vaccines, particularly human vaccines, is you can look at elderly ferrets and you can look at infant ferrets. So you can look at BCG vaccination in an infant ferret. We have a, one of our investigators on campus has 15-year-old ferrets for looking at influenza vaccines in an elderly population. So all of these things are, are possible. Hard to do field studies, obviously, with ferrets, though badgers might suffice. Uh, and then again, the reagent availability is quite good. NIH has a reagent repository called Team Ferret. You can get t-shirts. It's great. Okay. Anyway. So this is how we do these tests. Experiment one, this is determine if ferrets initially can even be infected with mycobacterium tuberculosis and develop disease. Obviously, if we're going to show transmission, they have to get sick, they have to show disease symptomology. These are the screens, and again, we take a lot of this from the influenza investigators. So you have to be able to look at these animals and not have to necropsy them. You have to be able to look at them every day or every week or every month, find mechanisms that demonstrate uh, infection and transmission without harming them in any appreciable way until obviously you get to the necropsy point here at the bottom. So there's a lot of testing, temperature, weight, skin test, all of these wonderful things that you are for, very aware with for, for human studies, skin testing, 
uh, there are IGRAs, there's an IGRA test available, etc. Um, and you do all of these tests, it's a lot of work, a lot of reagents, and the more ferrets you have, obviously, it compounds it. But, but all of these tests do work, and they are available. So to set up this experiment, the first thing we did, and I should have a disclaimer here, most of these data, virtually all of these data, are with mycobacterium tuberculosis, but we have started working with M. bovis, and the disease is similar, although it is more disseminated. Shocking. Um, so MTB, uh, Erdman, we used the Colorado State strain, low, medium, and high doses because we wanted to see if we could generate an infection through the intratracheal route. We looked at two weeks, four weeks, and seven weeks, uh, and necropsied at those points. Okay? So um, this is, I'm, I'm going to throw this at, at, at like a fire hose at you. We, this is a, a, a sampling of the kinds of tests that we run routinely. I don't know if you can read them very well back there. So midget, throat swab midget, uh, lots of midget uh, CFUs um, for these different organs. Uh, the PCR is over here for the nasal washes, skin testing, etc. This is a sampling. The, the, the actual list is probably three or four times longer than this. What I want to point out here is you get a very nice TST response over here. These are the most important ones from the standpoint of demonstrating transmission because you have bacteria in the upper airways. You have them in the nasal washes and you have them in the throat swabs and these are actual viable bacteria. So we determined that this is, if you can see these bacteria in the upper airways and they're coughing and they're sneezing and they're licking the other animals, they're probably doing something to be able to transmit it to a naive sentinel. Uh, in addition to that, if you're thinking pneumococcus and haemophilus, this is where you find colonization. And we found these bacteria consistently in the upper airways over a seven-week period in these animals. Again, these are intratracheal, artificially infected animals. But again, that, that gave us a, a lot of hope. A little bit of data, and I want to share a couple of things with you. These are lung counts, and these are the, this is from the low-dose infection. So this is the 10 to 50 mycobacteria intratracheally infected, and this is a seven-week period. We get replication of the bacteria to a pretty reasonable rate in these low-dose animals. Um, the spleen, eh, not so much dissemination, but what's really interesting is there's virtually no granulomas. Okay? So again, we're having this conversation about colonization. This is colonization. You see a lot of bacteria, but you see very little in the way of immune response. And this is a granuloma. It's a very nice necrotic granuloma, uh, very standard what we see in non-human primates, uh, humans, uh, etc. but we find them in the high dose only. You see some in the medium dose, but the low dose we saw absolutely nothing. And that was really kind of interesting, perplexing initially, but as we're getting into this colonization thinking mode, this is kind of exciting. The other part of this is the method of which we did the inoculations. Again, this is an intratracheal inoculation, which is extremely artificial with, uh, with broth-grown bacteria. We can have a whole discussion on how we do these models for looking at vaccine efficacy by just how do we grow the bacteria, but we don't have time for that today. So again, relatively high lung CFUs, but modest dissemination and no lung lesions. So this is a really interesting observation. The second experiment, we actually wanted to look at transmission. So in this study, we have one medium. We had to choose a dose, and so we chose a medium dose. So we could definitely have the animal develop some kind of disease. So we have one medium dose, and uh, we call it a transmitter, and one naive sentinel. Plop, put them in a cage, and off they go. Um, and there are four groups of these. So the way this experiment is set up here is, this is the TRs are the transmitters. Oops, sorry. The TRs are the transmitters, and the sentinels are the SEs. Transmitter one is housed with sentinel one, two with sentinel two, three, and four. So again, hope it, that's kind of the gist of it. Um, these were put together on day one. So we infect these guys by the intratracheal route, wait 24 hours, put them with the sentinel, and there they go. What happened is one of the sentinels died, but it wasn't tuberculosis. And so this gave us the, the idea at the time is to pull these sentinels out and put in brand new sentinels. So the difference here is these, when these sentinels were matched with the transmitters, it was 
on day one. There was no disease. When these sentinels were matched with the transmitters, the animals showed illness. They were losing weight. They had fever um, and other aspects of the disease. So we thought this is an interesting observation because this is, in, again, in a human population, dad comes home, just got infected today, and the kids have to live with dad, whereas dad has full, full bore active TB, and now the kids come home. There's, there's two very different kinds of, 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 of experiments that we wanted to look at here. So the bottom line that I wanted to show you here is, again, to us, the important areas here are looking at nasal wash PCR, lung PCR. These are magnificently positive in everything. So we see positives in the transmitters, we see mostly positives in the sentinels, and these were taken at the, at the end, at the, the necropsy. Well, we took them lots of times, but these numbers are from right before they were, they were sacrificed. Um, and then nasal wash colony forming units, we see a lot of positives in the sentinels, virtually no in the transmitters. In other words, this is all over the board. We see you know, negative culture here, we see positive culture here, sound familiar? This is what we see in a lot of human and bovine experiments. Okay, what I want to really push here though is this right over here, is that the number of granulomas we're seeing in the transmitters is virtually zero. Remember that previous experiment I showed you? Whereas in the sentinels, we have a lot. So how does that happen? We're seeing, does it have something to do with the mode of transmission? Or is it perhaps the natural transmission generates these granulomas? Okay, gets more confusing yet. So I'm gonna skip over this. This is just the, the, the summary of what I told you. But I wanna share with you one last aspect of colonization. So these are human experiments that were, were done. Um, this is by my colleague, Chris Whalen at, at UGA in, in a, in a, in, uh, uh, among children in, in Kampala, Uganda. And I'm not gonna go over, this is all the, the issues that we have between the TST and the IGRA tests, the fact they don't match a lot, they don't match each other all the time and they don't match what we see in the field some of the times. And I'm gonna show you how even more complicated it is than that because in this study, they actually cultured, or they did AFB sputum, and they did culturing uh, in, in these children's populations. And these bars represent who was positive for either a TST and or an IGRA. And this is where, who, who is culture positive without any positive skin test or IGRA. How do you explain that? Okay, this is a real, and this is not the only time we see this. This is actually becoming more of a, more of a, a, a routine observation, and it's all also being seen in the animal populations. So these tests do not identify this. Could this, again, be colonization? And in which case, you are, if it was streptococcus, you are not inducing the immune response. You are colonized. Another way to look at this, this is a colleague of mine, Ajit Lalvani, at, uh, in London, um, who sampled the uh, uh, upper airway epithelium from TB patients and controls. The bottom line is making primary cultures out of these epithelial cell types. He showed that um, there's 100 times more epithelial cells and macrophages in those washes, uh, in, those, in the cultures he, he acquires, but just there, there's actually more bacterial replication in the macrophages than the epithelial cells. The bottom line here is that the epithelium of the upper airway for tuberculosis is inert. It doesn't do anything. The bacteria attach and they sit there and they produce a very small amount of TNF alpha, but that is it. So again, if you think about streptococcus, that's exactly what it does. It is inert. It, the the epithe, upper airway is inert. So, and, so anyway, keep that in your brain. So the last slide is our experiment, which, which again goes back to this test with the ferret. And I've included the skin test here for a very important reason. So um, again, doing these sentinel um, uh, transmission uh, studies, uh, uh, we come up with, with these numbers. So matching the culture that we pull out from, the, from these various organs to the skin test, trying to think to the previous experiments we just showed. So we get some very nice, robust skin test responses here, 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 here. But here's a skin test negative, culture positive, just like we saw before. 
Here's a skin test positive, culture negative. We see very much what we're seeing uh, in, in the human and in some of the cattle experiments in these ferret studies. Um, and there does, there's really no correlation. So this transmitter, for example, transmits positive even though it has culture negative up here and, and vice versa. So what, is, what are we saying here? What I'm trying to try to convince you of is to think about this colonization step and that this model might be effective in, in, in assessing some of that, particularly when we look at vaccines, okay? I'm gonna skip the rest of it and I'm just gonna go to my thank you slide. Um, this was funded uh, by all these wonderful organizations and that's my eyeball over there to show you I actually do stuff in a high containment facility, so thank you. Thank you very much. Fred, um, very interesting and one of the things that for the TV Oh, the people that work in TV is the passion. And we can see <laughs> how much passion. Thank, Thank you, Fred. You. We have time for one question. If we do have, oh, please. <laughs> so, um, you know, with regard to the idea of human colonization, um, I'm certainly open to the idea based on what we saw with the oral swabs. <laughs> um, colonization, you know, it's, it's, it depends on how you define it. Um, it might be that, that some of these people just receive a slug of this, of this stuff and their um, innate immunity managed to clear it. And so they got into their lungs and they cleared it out. They're not susceptible to infection. Colonization maybe implies that they're dividing and it's, they're going to be there forever, which might not be the case. Mm -hmm. But certainly with both sputum and oral swabs, you see in very highly endemic populations, you see a certain baseline of positives. In, for example, positive sputum, it's very typical for people in South Africa to report. If they collect pot, a sputum from uh, healthy, apparently no TB individuals, two or three percent might come up positive. And right. it's just. Let me again mention two items about that. So, if you, again, you think about the streptococcal uh, colonization studies that have been going on for many years. What you see in this case is um, a, no activation of the innate immune response. It is completely a blank slate. So the whole concept here uh, is, to, is to, to maintain this passive capability, extracting the nutrients you need, but don't alarm the host that you're there. But it, it's, a, it's, a, it's a transient thing. So when, I, again, years ago when I was at the CDC, we would do these samplings and you would find in the same individual, they were colonized, then they weren't colonized, then they were colonized, then they weren't colonized. It could, but the more recent studies are actually showing replication in, in both the human and the animal population. So you're right. It, it, colonization is a very difficult question to answer. The la one other little tidbit I might add to that is, is again, the Chris Whalen hypothesis here for colonization of, by, M by M Mycobacterium tuberculosis and humans in particular is that when you, he will find no culture in the airway and then the next weeks, he will find cultures in the upper airways of these children. But he found it in the stool the whole time. So the question is, is, is the gut another area that we need to be considering with mycobacterium tuberculosis? And during the night, you do your reflux, where you recolonize your upper airways completely separate from any kind of interaction with another person. So the point I'm trying to make is, I think we understand this much of what's going on with this bug. And I think if we understand it a little better, we'd have a better shot at it. Thank you, Fred. A lot, a lot more, uh, much more to learn. Uh, now we have uh, Dr. Suli Rob Osserman. Uh, my pleasure to, to have Suli here with us. She's going to be presenting the whole genome sequencing of zoonotic tuberculosis. Offers a pathway for collaboration between agencies and countries. Thank you. I'm a veterinarian, and uh, I work at the USDA National Veterinary Services Laboratory, and we're the diagnostic laboratory for the USDA in the tuberculosis eradication program. And um, I'd like to talk to you about a project or an issue that's been going on with California and Baja California. Uh, many, many people made this happen as a diagnostic laboratory uh, we receive samples and there's many people in the field, many different agencies, and this is a, a collaboration between human and animal health 
and um, all of these people on the Mexico side of the border and on the United States side of the border uh, played significant roles in gathering and analyzing these data. So one of the things that we noticed is, is that the public health and animal health were almost talking past each other. We were asking the same problem. In the animal health, we kept seeing tuberculosis show up in our cattle herds. And we were like, why are we having such a problem in California? And the public health laboratory um, also was asking that. And um, both the animal health and the public health published papers on, on these issues. And um, this is Colleen Scotts. And of course, here you can see the question of why the California Public Health Department was saying, why do we have such a problem with bovine TB in California? And we have the same Hispanic population in Texas, but we don't see this kind of a problem. Well, we thought we knew the reason why. And the reason why is because the USDA classifies zones in Mexico to allow for the importation of cattle. We import one million head of cattle into the United States from Mexico every year. And so based on safety, we turn around and we classify these and the red zones are not allowed to export into the United States. And as a matter of fact, there's borders drawn and movement restrictions in basically a lot of these areas because no trade is allowed, the Mexican government conducts no testing in the cattle. One of the interesting problems and the causes of this is it almost mirrors the human, the, the population density of Mexico. And so um, looking at this side by side, you can see that the high level of prevalence in these red areas corresponds to um, higher densities of population. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time because I have a lot of data to go through. But um, just to give you an idea of the whole genome sequences that we have, um, we have sequenced all affected cattle herds in California since 1992. So many years worth of isolates. And we've also uh, sampled about 80% of the fed cattle cases. And these are calves that come in. And remember, that includes some of those Mexican cattle coming across the border. And adult untraceable animals since 1991. And basically, after 2000, that pretty much go goes up to a close to 100% of isolates. In 2006, we uh, requested some samples from California, from, from San Diego, and they sent some human isolates. Those are included in 2010. We did a project to gather samples and serum from known infected cows so that we can have this serum bank so that we can assist with the development of diagnostic tests. And then um, there was an outbreak investigation in 2013, and by then our laboratory was whole genome sequencing. And so the state of California asked us to do an analysis, and with that, we learned where the problem was coming from. And so then we went ahead and recruited um, Raquel Mina Salazar and her group to actually work with us. And uh, she just ended up publishing her paper on the samples that she collected, which was 172 M. bovis isolates from Baja, California. And then in 2015 to 2016, we got 106 M. bovis isolates from San Diego Public Health. And this represented all the human isolates recovered in that county from 2010 to 2015. And um, we've also made an effort to get cheese uh, samples and, uh, and also Raquel contributed an additional five human isolates um, after her paper was analyzed, including three cheese isolates. And in 2016, we actually implemented a project with SIGARPA, which is the Mexican Animal Health Department. And we've got an additional 126 isolates from cattle. And all of these isolates that I'm talking about from cattle are collected at slaughter surveillance. So granulomas are identified and submitted to the laboratory. OK, so this is basically the number of whole genome sequences that we're going to be talking about and comparing. 
So I'm going to skip over how to interpret diagnostic tests and just kind of go right to the data. So this is the whole genome tree of uh, the TB complex. And um, many of you, especially if you're used to looking at this, this is the human, the human strains here. And my tree should look lacking to you because we don't do much human, human tuberculosis testing. But we've got uh, quite a few of the, the isolates from M. bovis. And the M. bovis isolates that we're talking about cluster here. And I just want to point out that M. bovis is difficult to genotype, and the reason why is because it clusters right here. When the human world talks TB, they're talking all of this lineage. This is the point time. They're diverging at the same time. We have a bottleneck population in cattle, and the older generation testing methods for genotyping were just very, very imprecise. So this is the tree that represents isolates that we've recovered from the United States and Mexico. And just to give you an idea, time is coming down this way. This is rooted back up to MTB somewhere up here. Uh, this is European, European Unicornal Complex 2. And um, for those of you that know BCG is here, uh, the Ravenel type strain is here. AF2122 reference is here. AN5 type strain, which produces the PPD, is here. And then our Michigan cases are here. All right. So with that, these cases in Baja cluster very tightly. So out of these 371 isolates, 349 of them cluster right here. And so um, 11 here, and then we have a scattering amongst some other places. And so basically, 97% of the isolates are represented here. And you can see this is a 50 SNP difference right here. So we're looking at somewhere um, just right here. There's probably about 100 SNPs from uh, this one to this isolate here. OK, for the human isolates, the same exact pattern. So these are California isolates, not Baja cattle isolates. So this is Southern California. And the human isolates, we end up with 91% that land here, another 2% here. So a total of 93% are clustering right with those cases in Baja. If we looked at Raquel's isolates that she collected from the people in Baja, California, we also see there were a total of 22. 21 of them land in this cluster here. And, uh, and uh, I can't uh, remember where the other one landed. I think it was up here. I might have missed it. How did this happen? Well, you're just going to have to believe me, because I'm not going to go through the whole story here. But this is time. It's coming down here. Oops, sorry about that. Time is coming down this way. And you can see that the ge geography of this common ancestor, the oldest common ancestor on this tree, is very distant. And we see transmission to Hawaii, Mexico, and Argentina. So this common ancestor is not localized to one group. You move down 24 SNPs, and all of a sudden, we start seeing United States and Mexico transmission. So right here at this common ancestor, the isolates that they come off here, but we've got Baja, California, and Nuevo Leon indicating that this was pretty much in the continental United States and also in Baja. If you go down far, a little bit farther, these isolates which where almost all of those isolates are located are um, almost 100% Baja California, indicating that this was a point source introduction right into Baja at a certain time period. You continue down, and then you see the Dominican Republic and Panama coming off essentially at the same time. And the bottom here is Michigan. And so our Michigan deer population in, is, has endemic TB in a very small region. And um, we have over 800 isolates whole genome sequenced. We know a lot about this population. This is about 
we estimate somewhere around 60 years of evolution right here, and you come back up here. And if you consider that this common ancestor would have been in Baja, California, it's not likely that Baja, California would have transmitted the Dominican Republic and Panama. It looks like to me that this was a United States dominant strain back in the day. We then spread it through the Caribbean and Central America, as well as Baja, California, and we have residual disease in Michigan. It's our only evidence. Otherwise, we would not be able to blame it on the United States. I want to just really quick cover this, um, this set of isolates right here just to kind of show you how special it is. One of the things is, is that cows don't go on vacation in Cancun and eat cheese. So they get infected from their herd mates. And from, in production agriculture, we have records of cattle movements. And so we understand, and this is just one strain, and you can just see how well these strains cluster within their own country. Um, and you can see Mexico here, Argentina, but then we have New Zealand. Down here we have South America. You can basically see when it was introduced and then the localized spread within, within those countries. Okay, and here's Mexico, 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 United States, USA. So this strain was introduced into the United States at least three to four times. And I'm just going to go ahead and um, talk a little bit about this. If you want to do back of the, the notepad estimations, what we've seen with our genotypic data, that we have about 0.3 SNP changes a year or three SNPs every 10 years. And if we look at that and we estimate when these common ancestors existed, and again, this is back of the notepad, and I actually trust my notepad better than I do BEAST. <laughs> The, the program. Um, so uh, if we estimate this is circa 1780, this common ancestor right here, 1860, this common ancestor right here then would be 1960. And by 1960, we pretty much had the disease eradicated from the United States. That means that Baja, basically, this common ancestor has a high probability that it's located in Baja. And you can see the green are Baja dairy cattle, the red are human isolates in California, and then the light blue are dairy cattle in the United States. We have pretty good border control. This was a 2009 outbreak, and while there is no way we did not determine the actual cause of this outbreak, um, but we do know that uh, there was at least one human in Southern California that had a very similar strain within the reasonable distance that this cow herd would have gotten infected. And I'm going to go ahead and I, I just want to uh, pop back here. We have a, a SNP table and just want to point out how closely related some of these isolates are. So again, the red are humans from California. The the um, purple are humans from Baja, California, and the green are cattle from Baja, California. And you can essentially see no SNP changes between this uh, and then a few here with these and then an additional. And when we see this, when we see this kind of diversity in a point source, that just tells us there's a great deal of transmission of that strain likely to have occurred and has existed for a while in that population. So pretty, pretty amazing. So this is just all of these isolates grouped in individual groups to just talk about and show you that the distribution of this disease is not even. Uh, again, the red are human isolates, the green are cattle isolates, and um, there's just a, there's there's. Uh, several hundred samples in this, but you can see there's areas that are green where there just doesn't seem to be significant spillover into the human population. But then there are areas of red where we have severe, severe populations. So this isn't random. There's something going on to allow this to happen. And we see it even in little things where um, the, these uh, people are one snip away from each other, but they're located, one in California, one in Baja, 
And, uh, but then we have a whole region of bovine TB in Baja, California that we haven't detected in humans. So what's the difference? What's the cause of this spillover? We don't really know. <clears throat> Another example, just classic, where we have areas where we don't see any spillover and then areas where we have significant, and I'd just like to point out, we talk about talking past each other being human and animal health. This is a perfect example in human, in, 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 in the United States, where we diagnosed a cattle herd uh, in, on slaughter surveillance in 2013. We went and did testing, and there were two affected herds. They all had the same genotype. And um, that was it. 2016 comes by. We obtain the isolates from that county, San Diego County. This is where that herd is, and we find a human match. And this human match was not found in the very good investigations that both California has done and the USDA has done. So this is a key point where if the databases are harmonized and we have the ability, and this is done in real time, these discussions between the appropriate agencies and the appropriate investigations can be done at that time. <clears throat> so I would like to uh, finish up by just show, talking a little bit about the cheese and the issues that we have. This area right here has been very severe. About 10% of the isolates that we've recovered from humans in San Diego County cluster in this area. And we have worked hard to try to find the source of this in cattle. We just found one cow. I don't think that's the source. That's from a dairy that purchased herds that have dispersed. And so maybe, maybe the herd that caused this has went out of business. But Raquel has collected three additional cheeses, and I'd like to point out where those are, and they're in pink. But this is the 2005 cheese that we found at the border, and you can see that there were associated human infections that were found between 2010 and 2015. Raquel's new cheese samples are located here and here. And this is very concerning. We have no documented human cases. And now we actually have found cheese being sold in Baja, California, where there isn't. And I wonder if we're going to find in the future human isolates recovered with that same genotype. OK, so a little bit of a quick summary of what we found. With whole genome sequencing, we can anchor isolates to where their source is. And um, so if we look at the isolates that are covered in Southern California, 94% of them originate from Baja, California. That is their source. If you look at the Baja, California, 22 isolates, again, 95% of them are, are, we can anchor right back to that region. However, if we look at different other parts of the United States, and we, we don't have a large number of isolates, we have 25 isolates from various other outbreaks, and not one of those we found as a source from Baja, California. So that, that, that local cattle population is causing that severe disease, and we think that this is the reason why Southern California has a problem. In the cattle, as well as in the people, is due to this uncontrolled population of bovine TB in the cow populations in Southern California. So 95% of the human cases originate from cows in, in Baja, California, in the non-accredited zone. These human cases cluster, suggesting there are unique events that cause to spill over into humans, and it's just not universal. And so it gives us the opportunity to maybe pinpoint and focus on particular producers or particular practices. These data suggest that possible human-to-cow transmission may have occurred in the United States. And we have this project right now that we're continuing to slaughter surveillance and cheese, and that project will likely continue through 2018. And so with that, again, all of these people made this happen. So thank you very much.